For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and you're listening to this podcast, which is a part of the Inside Carolina Podcast Network. So first off, thank you for being here. If you haven't already, subscribe to Inside Carolina. Do that wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube so you never miss any of the content our team at IC puts out. It hardly takes any time, and it helps us out a great deal. Also, speaking of support, we want to support the people that support us. So that's why on this podcast, I have to remind everybody about Jimmy's Famous Seafood. The reason they wanted to sponsor this podcast is simple. They're owned and operated by UNC fans. With the pandemic and indoor dining restricted, it's a tough time right now to be a locally owned business. So it's helping out one of our own. And at the same time, you get ridiculously good seafood at a great price. It's a true win-win. Follow them on social media. They were going crazy this week when UNC beat Duke. And for everybody wondering, my go-to order is the famous gift box where You get two massive crab cakes, two different kinds of crab soup, and then a half pint of crab dip. Visit them online at jimmysfamousseafood.com. And at checkout, use the code hashtag GDTBATH for free two-day shipping. That's promo code hashtag GDTBATH. All right, let's get to it. As always, I'm joined by my guy, Carolina basketball legend from the Oklahoma City Thunder, Justin Jackson. Justin Carolina wins the Battle of the Blues, beating Duke 91-87. What were your general takeaways after watching that game? Um, general takeaways, man. I, I think number one is it was good to see them come out with the win. Um, you know, no matter how good or how highly ranked or whatever the both teams are, everybody knows that rivalry is crazy. And so um, seeing us be able to come out with that win was, was, was big time. Um, I think it's a tough time right now because uh, there was some there was some really good spurts, there were some really bad spurts. Um, but like I said, I think for them it's just a matter of um, taking that momentum of winning a game like a Duke North Carolina win and continuing that. So hopefully they can keep that up. Yeah, from a basketball perspective, this was a huge answer coming off that Clemson loss where no starter scored in double figures at Duke. You get the complete opposite where every every starter scores in double figures. How was Carolina able to find so much offensive success? And I'm not going to let you use the crutch and say that Duke is just a, a bad defensive team, which you could make that argument too. <laughs> I think you could very easily make that argument. Um, but I'm not going to come at Duke. Um, I think they really took advantage. You saw how Garrison got involved really early. Um, you know, I think they really took advantage inside. Um, and honestly, their guard play played really well. You know, Kerwin came out, hit a few shots early on, and then Kayla pretty much the whole game really was a problem. And so, um, you know, when you have that kind of mixture, you know, you're able to kind of take it, you know, they had an advantage down low. So the fact that they were able to take advantage of that early and then they had that outside force as well, I think that, you know, it was a great combination of everybody really coming out there and playing well on the offensive end. It's the third time in the last four games that UNC has shot over 50% for a game. There was some panic after the Clemson game, but in this recent stretch of games, that now kind of seems to be the outlier. Is that kind of how you view it, where that Clemson game is just something in the past and not really indicative of who this Carolina offense is and can be? I mean, I think it's just a matter, you know, I think for one, you know, and I know a lot of fans are the people that are watching these, you know, these podcasts or whatever after one game you can't necessarily just get super super worried until it gets to the point where it's okay we're in the tournament and it's like ah this is really sketchy but against Clemson you know there were a lot of things that happened that you haven't really seen in a lot of the other games you know as far as you saying that nobody scored in double figures you know like nobody else that hasn't happened in any other game right and so it's like with those type of games it's a matter of for the team learning and figuring out, okay, like what, what was the real problem here? You know, and I think going against Duke, who obviously, you know, I think Clemson is a little bit better of a team than Duke is, but, you know, going against a team like Duke that I feel like they really carried over the things that they, you know, went back and looked at and they really could try to get better at. So, you know, I think it's just a matter of them doing that each and every game, whether it's a bad loss, like a Clemson game, or it's a big time win against a Duke team, just trying to find those things that they can continue to get better at and carry it over into the next game. It was a raining threes on Saturday in Durham. And these stats come from UNC's SID, Steve Kirshner. 
Carolina tied its season high, making 10 threes. It was a season high 66.7% from three. It's the fourth highest three-point percentage for UNC in the Roy Williams era, and it's the best three-point shooting percentage for UNC against Duke, excluding a game back in 1983 when the ACC moved the three-point line up to 17 feet, nine inches. Kerwin goes four for four. Caleb goes four for five from three. Having played there before, is it true how soft the rims are at Cameron Indoor? It definitely is soft. Um, now, I feel like they kind of had an advantage because they didn't have the Cameron crazies going nuts. Um, when there are fans in there, it's so it's a, it's a totally different experience. But the fact that they, like you said, Kerwin went four for four. Caleb, who a lot of people have been saying he's struggling shooting or whatever, four for five in a game like Duke UNC rivalry game. Um, I mean, that's big time, you know, and I think that just shows, you know, the capabilities of these guys. You know, I think like like we've talked about with Caleb before, like he's shown spurts, you know, of being really good. Like these, the, all of the guys collectively have showed spurts of, okay, this team could be a pretty good team. You know what I mean? And so it's a matter of taking that and realizing, okay, we could do this each and every game, you know, and we can go out there and play like this every game. So, you know, it was definitely a good sight to see. I didn't even know those stats as far as uh, the percentage and all that sort of stuff, because we had some really good shooting teams. And the fact that they they set a record, that's impressive, man. Going further off your point about Caleb Love, he was, for me at least, the story of this game and how he really rose to the moment. He scores a career-high 25 points on over 50% shooting from the field, 80% from three. He has seven assists, and he also had the, uh, the monster dunk over uh, Breakfield, I think, that – should make every UNC Duke highlight reel moving forward. What did you kind of make of Love's career night? Um, I think he just looked comfortable, you know, like he was in control. Um, He looked like he had been there before, which I know is tough as a freshman, especially going into a game like we talked about, the rivalry game against Duke. It's tough having the emotions, the adrenaline, all that sort of stuff. But he looked like he was in control. You know, he looked like he – was really just out there just playing basketball and playing how he knows how he can play. And, um, you know, it was, it was definitely very encouraging and it was awesome to kind of see him be able to step into that, especially in a game like that. Um, So hopefully he can kind of take that and and keep that confidence going forward. One thing that I've noticed with love and the recent run of point guards for Carolina going to Kobe White and Cole Anthony is that, Roy, despite the criticism, he has evolved and modernized his offense a bit to fit certain players. And with love, it's been more sets for him out of horns. How would you describe to to fans what horns is and why it does benefit someone with love skill set? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think first and foremost, I don't know if coach necessarily modernized the offense um, because horns, I think, is just another way of getting some sort of for one, trying to get the point guard downhill. Um, you know, so if the point guard is able to come off the first screen on horns and get it downhill, cool. You know, that's awesome. Um, but then I think also it's another way for them to get like a, a high low with the two bigs that they always have in. Um, it's also able to create kind of that, the way coach likes the offense as far as having at least one big down low, you know, as far as, you know, if, if the, the big rolls down there, if he's not open, rotating it, rotating it, and then there's still a big able, you know, to kind of post up down low. So, you know, it is cool to see coach, you know, obviously, you know, putting in a few plays to try to, you know, keep the offense going. You know, if, if a team already knows kind of the secondary break and the things that, you know, we've always had in. Um, so, I mean, I think it's cool. And, and, and their ability to try to take advantage of those different plays, I think, was pretty cool to see against Duke. Horns is huge at the high school and the AAU level. How big do you think that is for Love where he does look comfortable? And it it might be something as simple as, you know, you're running an offense that he's more comfortable with, like Horns, that he probably thrived in out of high school. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the players being comfortable, you know, and especially with somebody, you know, the the games that Caleb Love has played in and played really well, um, I think there is a different feel that you can kind of have um, of, you know, just feeling comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Like the game that he had 20, 
you know, he really just looked like he was out there just playing basketball, you know, like the game against Duke. It looked like he was really just out there hooping, you know, and I think whether it's having those plays and horns or whether it's just him mentally going into the game, feeling comfortable. Um, I think for all of them, that's the whole point of basketball. If you're not comfortable playing basketball, then you're not going to be able to play at your best. And so, you know, if they can kind of keep that confidence and keep that, you know, ability to stay comfortable out there in that offense, I think they could be pretty good. The love we saw on Saturday, I think that's what Carolina fans thought they would be getting this entire year with somebody as highly regarded as love and with love and even Dayron sharp, there were people that projected them as one and dones before the season started. When you came to Carolina as a top 10 recruit, did you come in thinking you would be there for multiple years? And how did you kind of handle figuring out when it would be the right time for you to make the jump to the NBA? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't go in there thinking that I was going to be a one and done. Um, you know, obviously I, you know, I tested, um, you know, I had coach kind of get all the information, all that sort of stuff at the end of each year, but I kind of took it year by year. And for me, I, the first two years, I didn't feel like I necessarily put out the best Justin out there, you know? And so that's why I stayed for three years. You know, nowadays, some guys can go into college thinking, okay, I'm just going to be here for one year, you know? But I think for me, I took it year by year with guys like Caleb and Dayron and whoever else, you know, even outside of UNC, it's, it's a matter of just feeling like you're ready, you know, because somebody told me um, whenever I was going through the process, it's not a matter of when you get there, but how long you can stay there, you know? So even if you, they were to leave this year, you know, it's a matter of trying to get to that next contract or stay in the league for seven to 10 years or however long it might be, instead of just saying, of just saying that I went to the NBA, you know? So you know, we'll see as, as the time goes on. Obviously, like I said, it's, you know, it's a matter of them staying comfortable and them going out there and playing well and, and playing um, as confident as they can while they're still in school and kind of let the, let the, the future kind of however, however it may lay, you know. We were supposed to have the Miami game to talk about this week as well, but that game got canceled just two hours before tip off after the party video surfaced where UNC players weren't wearing masks and for me, it's like, I know these players made an obvious mistake, but I can also understand that half the fun of being a high profile athlete at Carolina is getting to be the big men on campus where you can go out and you can celebrate a win over Duke. That's why I'm never going to be someone who's throwing stones at these guys when it's a situation where one, I'm sure when I was in college, I made plenty of mistakes where people could have, you know, piled up on me and two I'll never be in their shoes in a pandemic where every move I make is under this microscope and so that's kind of where I'm at with this situation what's been your thoughts as this situation has kind of unfolded yeah I mean I'm, I'm kind of right there with you um, you know obviously like the pandemic we didn't have to go through it while we were in college you know so it adds a totally different dynamic um, I think a big thing is, you know, obviously coming off a huge win against Duke, right? Like, like you said, the like half the fun of being in college and being a college athlete is celebrating and enjoying those big time wins, you know? So I don't blame them at all as far as trying to celebrate it. Um, I think the fact that you are a North Carolina basketball player um, during a very unprecedented time, like in the world, there is a different responsibility that you do have, you know? So it's like, okay, go celebrate. Like, I'm not at all saying don't celebrate, but there is a part of it where it's, okay, you know what though? We have to be responsible in this just in case, because we know all eyes are on the basketball players on campus, you know? So whether it's a video or whether it's just other students or whatever it is, like people are going to be watching. Um, but like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a, tough, a tough situation um, obviously like the virus is very serious and it's, it's tough to say, you know, that it's not a big deal. Um, but I think them kind of owning up to it and them saying, Hey, we apologize. You know, we weren't at all trying to be, um, not safe or whatever. I think that was a big step. Um, so I think it's just a matter of learning from it, um, and trying to, you know, just like everybody else during this time man, learning from everything that's going on and trying to move on. The, that responsibility of, 
being a North Carolina basketball player is something I kind of wanted to ask you about too and kind of go further into that. And what is it like being the superstar at a school like UNC where everything you do is being watched? Because when I was at Carolina and I went out, I never had to worry about people wanting me to get in pictures or getting in videos or having to worry that someone's camera on their phone was always on me every time I stepped out or every time I went out. Yeah. So, so I was never, I was never a big guy that like really went out like that. Right. But, but I know just from like, you know, maybe the times that maybe I did go celebrate with teammates or even just going out to eat, right. Like you walk into a restaurant in Chapel Hill and everybody knows who you are, you know? And so it's like, obviously that's a great, like it's an honor and a blessing. Right. But at the same time, it's like, you do have a different responsibility. Like you can't just be acting just ignorant, right? Like you can't, cause you know, somebody could easily just pull out a phone at any time and just start recording or do whatever. Um, so it is, it is different, especially cause I mean, most of these guys are still, still young, right? Like they're not even 21 yet. And so it's like stepping into that and stepping into kind of that responsibility and, having to take on that mantle of, okay, I am this, like, almost a celebrity, right, in in Chapel Hill. It's a different type of responsibility that you have to take on, and you have to kind of learn it quickly because it kind of comes at you fast. Yeah, I remember going back to my freshman year, I would be with, like, Marcus and our friend group in the dining hall that was, like, um, I guess it was, like, Marcus, Bryce, and then uh, some other people who didn't play any sports. And then we would be in like the dining hall and I would go up and get food. And then when I came back to the table, there would be like a line of 15 or so people wanting to take photos with them. And I remember I would just be like sitting down, like trying to eat, like, I don't know how these guys do it. And I, I always give you guys a lot of credit because for, for as big as like we want Carolina football to get, that's just not something that Carolina football players really have to deal with on a daily basis. And I, th- I think that's going to start to happen with a guy like Sam Howell, mm-hmm. but for, for the better part of when we were at Carolina, that's not something we ever had to deal with, but you also spent time in the NBA's bubble. And while the situation is a bit different since you were there being paid, how tough was that on your mental where you are separated from your family and, you know, you're there just to play basketball, you go back to your room, you go to sleep, you wake up, you're playing basketball, but you're so separated from reality and separated from your family. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's a little different. Um, like I'm married, so it's like, okay, I'm away from my wife, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I mean, I think the one thing, like the couple of things I think might help with the college quote unquote bubble is in college, you're such a, like, you're such a close it's like you do everything together. You know what I mean? So it's like, you you know, you you might have practice in the bubble, you might have a game, but then, I mean, most of the time the guys are probably going to still hang out together. You know what I mean? Um, And so that might help them a little bit. Plus they'll have schoolwork while they're in there or whatever. Um, But I think the bubble is, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing because it is taking you out of your natural element. Right. And taking you like as basketball players, and as a, as a athlete at all, you have those things that kind of you get away from, like to get away from the sport or your profession that you can kind of get your mind off of, like what it is that you're doing. And when you go to a bubble, you don't really have those things. You know what I mean? Like in college, it would have been like me going and getting a bite to eat with a couple of the guys, right? Or us going and going to a movie or whatever. You know, like when you go to a bubble, you don't have that. So it's a matter of like trying to get your mind right for, okay, I'm here for a purpose. I got to make sure that I get everything done that I need to get done um, and try to stay in that mode. Cause if you're, if you allow yourself to kind of get, you know, down and out that you don't have those certain things or whatever, it can get tough, but I think, I think they'll be all right. I mean, it'll be an interesting. And I think a part two that helped me was like, it's a part of history. You know what I mean? Like our NBA bubble was like the first and hopefully <laughs> hopefully the last bubble, you know, ever in the NBA. Um, And so for them too, it's like, it's the first bubble or, you know, quote unquote bubble for college basketball and hopefully the last one. And so, you know, I think that also helps a little bit knowing you're a part of history. The other thing that I think that kind of makes this whole situation tough is that 
you know, it, it's kind of hard on everybody, but at the end of the day, the coaches and the staff, they get to go mm-hmm. home to their families and the players, they're separated from their families for, you know, months on end during this season and having to kind of bear that. And it kind of just reminds me of when our football team, we went to um, Detroit for the quick lane bowl and mm-hmm. we were, we were in Detroit for Christmas and like everybody was kind of depressed. We were in this kind of rundown ish type city with nothing to do. And like all the coaches were telling us like, Hey guys, it's, it's not that bad, but you know, they had their families in the hotel with them. So we were kind of like, you guys really don't understand completely what we're going through right now. So I think it's, it is something to keep an eye on to see how Carolina responds to this. And if you are Carolina, how do you move on from this where this doesn't become the moment that defines your season, especially coming off such a big win against Duke? I mean, I think, like I said, um, like I said, I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, really just learning from it, you know, and really um, trying to understand that it is an, a, a situation where, um, you know, where it is, uh, like I said before, unprecedented, you know what I mean? Um, and I think it is one of those things where everybody is learning on the fly, you know? So it's like this situation happened, somebody videoed them. And so now it's learning, okay, how can we celebrate and how can we be responsible with everything going on when we have a big time win, you know? And, and, you know, people are going to say stuff and and fans or whatever are going to be, you know, might throw stones or whatever, but it's a matter of them themselves staying close to each other and realizing, okay, this isn't going to be what our season is about, you know? And I think if they can do that, that's kind of what, you know, I think that's the most important thing is where they have a bad game against Clemson or this video comes out or whatever else happens, like the team, the the coaches, everybody staying close knitted within that, you know, and if they can do that, I think they can keep on going throughout the season as if, you know, you know, that this stuff didn't happen and hopefully making better and better news um, as the season goes on. All right. We'll see how UNC handles this adversity and if they can bounce back, kind of like Justin was talking about. But UNC is scheduled to take on Virginia on Saturday, Virginia Tech on Tuesday. So a big stretch of games against ranked teams coming up for the Tar Heels. We'll be back next week to break it down. Justin, playing the Lakers tonight, when this comes out, everybody – We'll already know how you did in the game, but you dropped 14. Any predictions for tonight? Are we going for double digits again? <laughs> man, I just try to go out there and take advantage of my opportunities, <laughs> man. If, if if 14 comes again or whatever comes again, then so be it. But I'm just going to go out there and play as aggressive as I can and hopefully make more opportunities. All right, Justin, appreciate it. Good luck tonight and looking forward to catching up next week. All right, appreciate it, my guy.